You're listening to BioTalk with Rich Bendis, the only podcast focused on the biohealth capital region. Each episode, we'll talk to leaders in the industry to break down the biggest topics happening today in biohealth. Hi, this is Rich Bendis. Welcome to another edition of BioTalk, where we interview CEOs, entrepreneurs within the biohealth capital region. And today, we're lucky to have Emily English, who is the Chief Executive Officer for Gemstone Biotherapeutics to BioTalk. Welcome. Thank you. And I haven't met you before, have I, Emily? No, this is the first time we're meeting. This is great. And you know, a lot of people say we need to get more women entrepreneurs on biotech. So I am listening to my listeners. Well, great. So I hope we we help to fit the bill for that today. You definitely fit the bill for that. Let's introduce you to our listeners, a little bit of your personal background, and then we'll get a little more into your entrepreneurial experience with Gemstone. So I'm a Maryland native. Grew up for a number of years on the Eastern Shore, went to high school in Ellicott City, did a bachelor's degree at the University of Maryland College Park in chemistry, and then went out to the University of Wisconsin-Madison for a PhD in chemistry. What attracted you there? So, you know, I obviously, you know, you're looking around at all the different research programs at these different schools as you're thinking about graduate school, and there was just so much exciting stuff going on at the University of Wisconsin-Madison that... Once I got the acceptance letter, it felt like that was the obvious place to go. Great. Yeah. So I had a fantastic experience there, loved living in Madison. And my husband and I were settled and and pretty happy there. We had our first child. And then we felt like we needed to be back closer to family. So, you know, we both sort of started looking for jobs and he landed a job at the Applied Physics Lab. We moved back here and about a year later, a job opened up at the Applied Physics Lab in Laurel that that I then took. So started as a bench chemist. And that's APL, right? APL, yes. Yes. And you're going to explain what APL is. I can huh? sure explain what APL is. Do you want me to do that now? Yeah, you can do we, that okay, now so. because a lot of listeners know APL, Applied Physics Lab, but don't understand it because it's a well-kept secret. Yeah. <laughs> so APL is, I believe, the second largest employer in Howard County. Second only, I believe, to the public school system. I hope I have that correct. I'm sure someone will correct me if I've got it wrong. But yeah, it's a national security and government contracting laboratory. It has an enormous concentration of technical experts across multiple disciplines, everything from propulsion systems and sonar and missile systems to chemistry and biology and software development and electrical engineering and pretty much anything that you can, you know, want to find some technical expertise and you can probably find it there. And so we're, we were deeply involved in, in national security, you know, projects there. Things we can't talk about. Yes, <laughs> very true. But, you know, great work, brilliant people, and, and important, you know, programs for the nation. APL has an affiliation with Hopkins as well, correct? Yes, they do have an affiliation with Hopkins. That's a little bit complex at this point in time because when Ron Daniels assumed the presidency of, of Johns Hopkins, he was a Canadian and not an American citizen. And so they split APL sort of out organizationally. But yes, we have that kind of affiliation with Hopkins and, and they could tap into all of the Hopkins you know, capabilities and networks and everything. APL is formerly a university affiliated research center is sort of the, the technical description of what it is. Yeah. Okay, great. And that's part of your background. It gets you to the Whiting School of Engineering, right? Yeah, so the technology that we license from Hopkins into Gemstone came out of Professor Sharon Garrick's laboratory at the Whiting School. I actually did not know Sharon before joining Gemstone, so she was sort of a new new connection, but she's brilliant and was a co-founder of Gemstone. So our our technology comes from them, you know, and we have a, a great relationship with Hopkins at this point. It's been a big boost to our company as we've kind of gotten it started. We've been fortunate to be affiliated with the Fast Forward Incubator at Hopkins. And so sort of the nuts and bolts of our relationship with Hopkins is that they are an investor in our company. You know, they, they're on our cap table. We license the technology from them. We have some contractual obligations as a result of that license. And then we also then rent laboratory space in the Fast Forward Incubator which is is great because the rent rates are pretty favorable for companies that are just starting out. We have access to a, a lot of shared equipment, most of which would be just prohibitively expensive for a, you know a tiny little company. And then we can also access the Hopkins core facilities. So you know if you can imagine, we've needed to tap into confocal microscopy and scanning electron microscopy and all these sorts of capabilities, NMR spectroscopy, mass spectrometry 
tools that no startup can afford. Exactly. We'd never be able to do it. You know, so it's a real big a, a boost to us. And then on top of that, Fast Forward's really doing a great job, and Tech Ventures is doing a great job of building out programming to support early startups. So we're excited to be a part of that. You know, I fast forwarded a little bit because we skipped one important step. Okay. And that was really Gemstone was invested in by a local investor group in the Baltimore area mm-hmm. and someone we know well who's also been on Biotalk. And so you might talk a little bit about your relationship with Gamma 3 and George Davis. Sure. So Gamma 3 is a Baltimore group of, of local angel investors. The chairman of our board is a gentleman named David Oros, who's the primary investor in, in Gamma 3. And, and George Davis, who's now the CEO of Tedco, was a, a partner in Gamma 3. And they made an early investment in Sharon's technology to bring it into Gemstone. And so, yeah, we've been really supported by the Baltimore kind of entrepreneurial community. And the other thing is, it's unique, you had never run a company before. No. And so George was evaluating transitioning from Gemstone as an investor and operator Mm -hmm. to Tedco and had to find someone to come in and run the company. Yep. And so how did you two connect and why is it that you with no entrepreneurial CEO experience was selected to run Gemstone? Yeah, it's it's a great question. It's one that I think a little sometimes people look at me a little bit sideways when, you know, I wasn't a founder of this company. I hadn't run a company before. It's not exactly the origin story that fits with most people's expectations, right? And so I actually am friends with the CEO of another Gamma 3 portfolio company, a company called Terbium Labs that is headquartered in Federal Hill in Baltimore. And their CEO, Danny Rogers, knew that George was looking for someone to bring on to the team. And and I was at a point in my career at APL where, you know, I had kind of grown from bench chemist to project manager to program manager. And the job was great and I understood it well and I was just feeling a little bit restless. And so I was kind of starting to look for a new opportunity and Danny made the connection to George and George and I sat down over coffee one morning and kind of hit it off immediately just on a personal level. And I think what George saw in me was a combination of the right kind of technical expertise to really drive the development of the technology to a new place. And then also some experience in in sort of multidisciplinary management that grew out of my APL sort of training, if you will. At APL, I had really learned how to manage outside of my technical swim lane because I had in my portfolio everything from chemistry and biology to software and hardware engineering and kind of everything, you know, kind of in between. And so that experience forces you to become a quick study in areas that you're not a deep technical expert and and figure out, you know, whose opinions do you trust and can you rely on, right? And that all of that experience is actually a great teacher for, you know, being an entrepreneur, right? So by the time I left APL, I was running a program that was probably 30 or 40 staff and worth about $6 million a year. I was running a tiny little business inside of this much larger organization, right? So in many ways, all of those skills translated directly to running a small startup company. And so, you know, it kind of, it worked. I mean, and I've had to kind of build my skill set and build my knowledge base in other areas like intellectual property and financing and fundraising and all of those kinds of things are, are different inside this small business than they were at APL. But, you know you apply the same skill set. You, you figure out who you can surround yourself with that knows things that you don't know. You learn to trust people, right, to steer you in the right direction. And then you just execute against a plan. And so that's what we just, we try to do that every it's day. It's very simple, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it sounds you simple, doesn't it? Sound it? Simple. Yeah. So, I mean, let's talk about the evolution of the technology at Gemstone. So what was it that you inherited when you came in? Mm-hmm. And where are you, where have you progressed to today is the strategy for the business model for Gemstone? Sure. So Sharon's technology is a biomaterials technology. For lack of a better descriptor of the material itself, it kind of feels and looks like stiff, wet jello. And the material was designed to mimic certain properties of the skin. And so the hypothesis really being that when skin is absent, in the case of acute surgical excisions in the dermatology space, for example, or chronic wounds. Burn patients. Burn patients. 
that you know you lose mechanical information, right? And the skin cells actually respond to their mechanical environment. And so when you lose that sort of correct mechanical environment, you get scar tissue formation or you turn over into sort of a chronic wound state where the wound doesn't heal. And so Sharon had developed this material that sort of matched certain properties in the skin. And then when it was applied either in third degree burns or excisions in preclinical wound models, they looked at mice and at pigs, the material induced regeneration of the skin, including hair follicles and sebaceous glands, kind of markers indicative of normal, healthy, stretchy, you know, correct feeling skin. Right. And so the gemstone team sort of prior to my arrival had really been thinking carefully about the wound care market. And I came in and sort of took a look at everything that we had and that we were doing. And, you know, the the wound care market is incredibly important. It's very large. It's also very complex because the patients that go through wound care often have multiple pathologies going on. They may have underlying sort of comorbid conditions like diabetes that complicate their healing. It's also a market from a product point of view that's very crowded. So there are a lot of products that are classified as sort of skin replacement products Mm -hmm. on the market that are in use and they're all sort of competing with each other. And when you start to talk to, to doctors in that space, you know, a lot of them, you know, just there's a lot of sort of frustration, feeling like a lot of the products don't perform the way they would really like them to. Everything in the clinic, as opposed to in the laboratory, is is messy and complicated and, and not super straightforward. And so, you know, as we learned that about the chronic wound market, we really started to think, okay, is there a better way to sort of target our initial launch? And that's when we started to really explore the dermatology market, which for us is, is pretty interesting because there you're looking at acute injuries, right, or, or wounds that are created in a doctor's office, so they're a little bit better controlled. Right. And there weren't really that many products, as best we could tell, that are you know, currently in pretty extensive use in the dermatology space. So from our point of view, from a business point of view, it looks like a more open marketplace where it's going to be easier for us to kind of differentiate ourselves. And given what we were seeing in the preclinical data where we have this very robust regeneration that is induced by our material, you know, we thought, hey, there's an opportunity to really address the dermatology space where, as we've learned over several months, there are real challenges in getting wounds closed because most of the excisions that dermatologists are performing are on the face and the scalp, all the sun-exposed surfaces, and there's not a lot of extra skin in those areas. So it's a real challenge for, for doctors to sometimes even get a good closure. And so they have to enlarge the surgical site to then create a flap and pull it closed, or they're doing a skin graft or something else. And, you know, the results vary for those. And and because all of that is exposed skin, people care about what the result looks like in the end. So we think there's an opportunity if our regeneration that we're seeing preclinically holds when we move into the clinic, we think we could have a real impact in that dermatology space. And we're talking about a regulated environment as well, not an OTC a dermatological. Clinic. No, not not OTC for now. So we are going to be going through the FDA as a medical device. So we have to go through FDA approval and, and then, yes, we'll be sort of an office-based Use. And what stage are you in that process? So we are planning to submit our medical device package to the FDA either late this year, early next year. And we're in the process of scaling up our GMP manufacturing process and then sort of making a plan to go and collect clinical data. So a, a one particular sort of quirk, if you will, of the medical device space or feature of the medical device space compared to therapeutics is that for devices that are going through what's called a 510K pathway, which is what we're, we're headed down, you don't have to have clinical data in order to sell your product once you get that clearance from the FDA. So we could get our 510K clearance and then immediately go to market. But we know that the physicians are not going to be super interested unless we have really compelling clinical data. So we're kind of our our go to market plan is FDA clearance, GMP manufacturing capability and clinical data kind of achieve those three milestones and then launch the product. Just so three simple steps. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, the question would be, what are you looking at time wise and how much money is it going to take to get through that process to where the docs are going to be comfortable? We're raising right now about 
one and a half to two million dollars is what we need to hit to get ourselves through those early clinical studies. We don't envision that those early studies are going to be, you know, large randomized, multi-site randomized controlled trials. It'll just sort of be initial proof of concept work. And then, you know, once we have that, we think we'll position ourselves to really kind of hopefully go out and raise a larger round at that point to launch and, you know, accomplish a couple of other you know, things with our pipeline. And do you see that you're going to become a vertically integrated firm that does everything, or are you going to utilize resources you're going to contract with it for different elements of your company? So we do a little bit of both. Certainly on the manufacturing side right now, we're doing a lot through contract partners, and largely that's just driven by, you know, limited resources. Ultimately, if we do a second generation product, maybe we you know, develop our own manufacturing capability for something like that. But for right now, there's no reason to do that. On the earlier stage research and development side, you know, we are trying to sort of be integrated along that pipeline. We're starting to generate a whole bunch of new ideas that we're testing out in the laboratory. We're supporting a lot of them on non-dilutive grants right now. And so we've, we've received in the last six months an NSF SBIR, an NIH SBIR, and a stem cell, Maryland Stem Cell Research Fund commercialization award. And so for us, the grants are a great opportunity to develop some earlier stage ideas. You know, with a, an early stage company, the thing that you're always worried about is what could happen that's going to make my core technology potentially go sideways and and throw us off. And so you want to be, you know, constantly sort of developing some backup plans for that. And so so non-dilutive grant money is a great way to kind of shore up that pipeline. I agree. I'm talking to Emily English, who's the CEO of Gemstone Bio, located in Baltimore, right? Where are you located by? So we have lab space at the Fast Forward Incubator right. on the Hopkins Medical Campus, and we actually rent office space in Federal Hill. Oh, so you have two locations. We do. And how do you separate the duties between the two? So our technical laboratory staff hangs out most of their, you know, spends most of their time at Fast Forward. And then I'm pretty much full time in the office. And then there's a couple of other folks who kind of split their time in between. One of the nice things about Baltimore is it's actually not an unreasonable thing to have your space kind of split in two different spots because it's a reasonable drive. It's a pretty small city. And you have public transportation you can use it. Yeah. Or walk, really. So you talked about the non-dilutive, and we're a big proponent of non-dilutive, and we have some assistance programs for non-dilutive to help people. How many times did you have to go through submitting proposals before you were able to win either TEDCO, NIH, or NSF in your grant applications? It's actually a pretty good story, right? So I'm I'm very a big fan of all of these programs too, and we've had good luck. So we initially sort of cast our net widely. We looked at both the SBIR programs and sort of there's a whole DOD grant program called the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program, and we we tried a number of different things. It turned out that we had a pretty good hit rate with the SBIRs, and we didn't have any luck on the CDMRP side. So that allowed us to sort of focus pretty quickly on, okay, we'll we'll write SBIRs, because that seems to be the fit for us. So our first NSF proposal for us, an SBIR grant, was funded, which was great. And then, uh, how much was that, Emily? That's a phase one, $225,000 award. Great. Yep. And then on the NIH side, we our first one was scored and we got constructive comments, although we fell just below the funding line. So it was actually a pretty straightforward revision. And then it was funded on the second try. Phase one. Phase one again. Great. Yes. And then again, on the TEDCO side, our stem cell research grant proposal was funded first try as well. So... I hope that trend line continues uh, because we, you know, as I mentioned earlier, for us, the the non-dilutive funding right now is a great way to test out new ideas. So we are, you know, we have our core technology that our investment, our investors resources are really going into. And so then we're kind of, we, we have an idea that, okay, the first product is going to, you know, be commercialized next year. What's our second play going to be? And uh, right now, with the research pipeline and portfolio being what it is, we can kind of let that breathe a little bit. And we're sort of exploring a bunch of different ideas and hoping that something kind of declares itself. That'd be nice. Yeah. It just appears out of the... Well, I mean, at some point, the, the thing about early stage research, and actually, this is another reason, I think scientists actually make great entrepreneurs for 
for the reason that so much of science is about failure, right? Mm -hmm. You spend 90% of your time trying things that don't work. Right. And then you have to learn to recognize the little nugget of something that is going to work and really push hard on that, right? And I think, you know, in some ways running a small company is much the same way. So a small company that is doing early stage science, you know, R&D, it's a snowball of that. And it sounds like you're invigorated through this new challenge. I love my job. Right. I, I tell lots of folks that this is the most fun professionally I have had in my entire career. Yeah. So if it's the most fun, there are challenges early stage entrepreneurs have. And so I always ask the question, what do you lose sleep over most? Yeah. So I have this conversation with my team a lot, you know, and I'm always telling them, you guys are probably going to know that something's going to go sideways before I do. So, you know, your job is to let me know before those problems really become big. Because if we can see it coming, we can probably make a plan to deal with it. So the thing that keeps me up at night is, what is the thing that I don't know is coming? And how do I figure out what that is? And so in an early stage company, obviously, you don't have enough resources to solve every problem right now. So it's a sort of constant balancing act of, do we, do we try to solve this problem today or do we push this one down the road a little bit? You know, what's the best use of our, our resources and our money and our time? And then just getting out and trying to kind of talk to people who have done it before, surrounding myself with a group of advisors who can help me anticipate the problems before they arise, right? Yeah, it's that one that you never see coming. That's the one that worries you. And then you talk about your advisors and board. Are the board is the board made up primarily of investors at this point, or have you expanded beyond that? And then do you have an informal advisory board and a scientific advisory board as well? Or how far have you expanded with those boards? Our, we have a board of directors and we have an advisory board. So our board of director, directors is a mix of investors and you know outside experts, if you will. And actually, Sharon sits on our board. So you know having her sort of long-term knowledge of the technology development is very helpful. Our advisory board, I think of in sort of you know two different buckets, if you will. So we have a science advisory team, and that is a combination of clinicians and then also some researchers who can kind of who can advise us and and then we have a regulatory team as well. Regulatory is not an area that any of us on the team right now has deep expertise and so we lean heavily on that group. And then you mentioned that you're looking to do another round mm -hmm. of equity financing to complement your non-dilutive mm -hmm. about a million and a half. Yep. And have you started raising yet? We've started. We've raised about the first 400 of that. Good. Um, so. Hard circles or soft circles? You know that term now? No, I don't know oh, that term. <laughs> soft circles, sometimes our investors will say, we're in if you get to this stage or if this person or other entity comes in. Hard circles in, we're, we're in, we're committed, doesn't make any difference. Got it. Okay. okay. So then hard circle. Hard circles. That's the better. That's better than soft for sure. So I learned something today, yeah. right? Yeah. And and then we're working on the the next increment of that. Okay. So and, and really that is we're viewing this current fundraising effort as kind of a a bridge, if you will, because we think it's just a small increment of money. It's a bridge to a real series A. Exactly. Okay. So this is still seed mm -hmm. and it's a seed bridge. Yep. But you've already had a seed investment with mm -hmm. Gamma 3. That's right. Do you think that you're going to be able to round out this full investment within this region, or are you going to have to go outside the region? Well, I think it's going to be a mix. Mm -hmm. So we're, we do have some good contacts here in the region, and then we're also talking to some investors outside of the capital region. So okay. it'll, be, it'll be a combination. And then, you know, you mentioned capital region. So we're trying to grow the biohealth capital region, which is a new brand for our region, mm -hmm. Virginia, D.C., and Maryland. And how do you find this as a place to grow an emerging life science business? So I'm a big fan. Um, I love being here. I mean, a part of it, I think, is that I just feel very connected to this place because I'm a Maryland native. And so I want to see the life sciences sector in this area grow and expand and become very vibrant. I think there's a there's a lot of really positive things that are happening and I feel a sense of momentum 
that I don't know that that was here 10 years ago, but I, it, it sort of feels like we're maybe on the early part of a wave that I hope is coming. Baltimore is actually a great place to start a company because things like laboratory space and office space are inexpensive. And, you know, we actually have a person on our team who works remotely from Boston. And what we hear from her is that, you know, it's prohibitively expensive to start a company in, in the Boston area these days. And live right? there. And live there. Right. Um, and, you know, and you can't find lab space. And so I think there's some overcrowding challenges mm -hmm. uh, that maybe we'll start to push things this direction. At least I hope we anyway. We hope so. I, yeah. I agree with you. I think the momentum is changing. It's shifting. People are talking much more positively than they had in the past about what we do have rather than what we don't have. But there are gaps that still need to be filled. And from your perspective, where are the areas you think we need to strengthen ourselves to really become a top three by 2023 that we keep talking about? Yeah. Which gaps do you find that are still lacking to help you grow? Well, the primary gap that comes to mind that I think a lot of entrepreneurs in this area face is that it's a great place to get that first infusion of seed capital. But then when you need that larger round, then it's a challenge, and then everybody, and then you start to have to look outside of the the area, which then becomes a challenge for some investors who really just prefer not to get on a plane, right? So that's one issue, and then the other issue that I hear a lot of people say, although I think I have a bit of a different opinion than sort of the going wisdom on this, is that we don't have, and maybe it's maybe it's a little bit naivete and just feeling like, hey, you know, I can I can do this, so sure. lots of people could do this, but you hear a lot of people say that we don't have the executive talent. We don't have the seasoned- Serial entrepreneurs. Exactly. Right. And maybe that's true. But I know from my experience at the Applied Physics Laboratory that I had a lot of the tool set that I needed in order to kind of move into an entrepreneurial enterprise. Mm -hmm. So I think there are other people out there who would probably have that same skill set. And so maybe we just need to collectively get a little bit outside the box about what a seasoned entrepreneur or a ready entrepreneur looks like. I listened to another podcast and heard Marissa Meyer mm -hmm. interviewed and she talked about the assistant product manager role that she developed at Google and talked about, you know, if you don't have the person exactly that you're looking for, you grow them. Right. And that's what she did through that program. And I think we could grow a lot more talent locally. And then we'd have this sort of self-replenishing well of people who are connected to this ecosystem, who aren't transplants, who want to be here, who want to grow it. Everybody's a little bit hungry and are really bought into the idea of this region. So I think maybe we just have to get a little bit you know, more invested in growing our, our own mm -hmm. talent. I need to take you on the road because I hear this all the time. We don't have capital or serial entrepreneurs or enough executive talent. And I think it's BS. Mm. I really believe we have a lot of talented people here. A lot of the people have never run a company, yeah. as you can, uh, you know, talk about in, in your own background and your own experience. But we have a lot of people that can learn very quickly. Mm -hmm. What they need is mentors. They need good advisory boards and they need to be given a chance. Yep. You know, we're not we're somewhat of a risk adverse region compared to other regions of the country. I started to break through that a little bit, mm -hmm. but we need you now, even though you haven't exited yet on this deal, you have so much experience you've gained in a short period of time as a first time entrepreneur that would be beneficial to other first time entrepreneurs. We need to get you to be able to be a mentor, but make certain you don't lose focus about what you're doing day to day because your board would not like that. And your investors <laughs> would not like that. I, either. I agree with that. Yeah. You know, it's it's interesting that you should bring up the the issue of mentoring, right? So I've I've thought it's one I've thought a lot about, right? Because I sort of in my role at APL, just by virtue of the kind of place it was, science and technology, close ties to the military, it's a place that was, you know, I got used to as a woman being the only woman in the room pretty right. frequently, right? And so I as I my career developed there sort of became an informal mentor to a lot of other women who were, you know, kind of coming through the organization, trying to figure out how things worked, figure out how to grow their careers. And it was actually a role that I I really relished. I loved the opportunity to kind of reach in and say, "You know what? There's this person over here and and she's really got something and you know, you just give her a chance, right?" To me, that's the difference between mentorship and sponsorship, right? Which are, you know, so you can find articles about how women are over mentored but under sponsored, right? And to me, the the definition of sponsorship is someone who will advocate for you when you're not in the room to do it for yourself. 
Man has ownership. Yes. I mean, the key is a lot of people talk the talk, mm-hmm. but they won't walk it. Yep. And so I think we need more people that I actually, you know, rather than saying in their resume, there are mentored 15 people, they need to really sponsor one person effectively mm-hmm. rather than talk about spreading this knowledge where they really don't make a, a great impact. I agree. Yep. So are you active in women in bio? I have gotten connected to a group of executives who are meeting through Women in Bio. But before that, I had not really didn't have an affiliation with Women in Bio. Okay. So, and these women executives, how, do you, how did you find each other? I, again, just made a connection to someone who sort of knew the group was going to be forming and went to an early meeting. And, and I stay in touch with a couple of the folks through that organization. So, you know, we'll see how that develops. It's pretty new. How can we help you? Oh, you know... I always feel like I can be better connected. Right. Right. So, you know, I'm I'm constantly trying to meet new people, figure out things that I don't know about, all that kind of stuff. By and, you know, just in general and broadly, you know, the, the, as anything that we can do collectively to grow the life sciences sector in this area is going to help everybody, us included, right? A rising tide lifting all boats. And, you know, of course, uh, fundraising is always the challenge, right? So that's sort of the, the one that's, you know, the great big blinking light in front of me that I keep my eye on constantly. So any introductions we can help with? Absolutely. Were you aware that we recently had an investor conference here? I was at the investor conference. And how many meetings did you have? I had just a couple of meetings. Did you find it beneficial? So it was interesting. So the, the meetings that I had scheduled didn't really pan out for us, but it was a lot of the informal conversations that were actually much more helpful. So Did you get a chance to talk with people who were investors that you weren't scheduled with mm-hmm. that you could talk in the future about setting up future meetings? I, yes. Okay. Yeah. Has anything resulted from that? No, nothing yet. But, you know, we still have some ongoing conversations. Well, you have a list of 32 investors that were in that program, yep. right? Mm-hmm. We know all them. Mm -hmm. So if we can help you with them, that would be a good start. All right. Okay. So that's one action item to take away from here. Great. Your research, though, in people in that community that invest in technologies like yours or related to that area would be a good first screen. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've had a chance to look through that. Yeah. So off of that list from that investor conference, there were a couple of potential, you know, medical device investors. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges for our company specifically in the medical device space is that there are just fewer investors on that side of things. I understand some of the reasons for that, right? So, you know, figuring out who we approach and, you know, who who's sort of worth spending the time and effort to go after, right? Because if we approach a therapeutics exclusively VC, you know, it's just not a fit from the start and that's not helpful for anybody. And then they're irritated with us and we're frustrated, you know, so. We'll see if we can help you on that. Okay. Let me ask you one last question about the region. You're based in Baltimore. Mm-hmm. You drove up here today, 35 miles to Rockville to do the bio talk, right? I did. What do you think the challenge is and how do we close the gap between Baltimore and this whole region in Montgomery County? Oh, man, I think, you know, that may be above my pay grade. No, but seriously, Um, I mean, your SBIR grants came from NIH. They come from NIH, for sure. NSF, wherever NSF may be. You're going to be working with the FDA and the regulatory environment, which is right down the road here. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's resources in both locations that benefit each other. Yep. But in some ways, it ends up being a little competitive. Yeah, which I don't entirely understand. And as an entrepreneur, you don't care. I don't. You want to get access to the resources you need to be exactly. successful. Exactly. I mean, I get, on a, I get on a plane and go to Boston when I need right. to. I get on a train and go to New York when I need right. to. You know, as an APL program manager, I had customers in Northern Virginia, and I would drive that sure. distance all the time, right? So I sh- sure wish that 495 didn't back up at three o'clock in the afternoon. Which is what you're going to be on this afternoon. No, actually, I took the ICC. Oh, okay. And so I, that's I, great. I'm headed yeah. back up that way. Right. So I think there's a, you know, there's certainly an infrastructure challenge. But as an entrepreneur, aren't you overcoming challenges every day? Yeah. This seems to be a small impediment for someone to get over. So this seems, I mean, it seems sort of meaningless to me in yeah, some ways. Right. I don't look at it as, you know, oh, I can't go over to sure. Montgomery County and talk to folks over there. You know, I, so. That's great. We're going to yeah. make you a poster child that shows you how you bridge the divide. Okay. Right? Okay. What is it you'd like to convey to our listeners that we haven't talked about? Just generally speaking, I think it's a great time 
to run a startup life sciences company. I think there is so much interesting research happening locally in this area that you can tap into. We also leverage our connections to the local university system for hiring. I think the talent in this ecosystem that we talked about a little bit, especially coming out of our, you know, out of College Park and UMBC and Johns Hopkins University is like one of the great sort of secrets of being in this space. You get these great technically trained, sort of entrepreneurially minded young scientists and engineers coming out of schools. And, you know, we're just thrilled to be doing what we're doing. We're really excited about the future of Gemstone. For us, the technology that we're developing is the gift that keeps on giving. It is an endless source of ideas. We think we could really have a tremendous impact in the regenerative medicine market, and we're very, very sort of optimistic about our future. I'm optimistic about how successful you're going to be. Thank you. I'm glad we had a chance to have this dialogue today, and we've been visiting with Emily English, who's the CEO of Gemstone Biotherapeutics, an up-and-coming, not wound company, but really a dermatological and wound therapy company Mm -hmm. that's going through the regulatory process and is getting ready to raise another round of capital, which if there are any listeners looking for a vibrant, emerging entrepreneurial company within the biohealth capital region, I could recommend Gemstone Biotherapeutics. Thank you very much, Rich. Thank you for being on Biotalk. Thanks for listening to Biotalk with Rich Bendis. 